Hey, what's going on everybody? Gary with FCP Euro. Welcome back to another DIY video. Today, we have a 2017 X5 xDrive 35i in the shop. Which is also the F15 chassis. And we're going to be installing a four corner brake kit. So we're going to be doing the fronts and the rears, which includes the rotors, pads, pad wear sensor. And chances are, if you're watching this video, you probably got a quote from the dealer or a shop for several thousand dollars to do this brake job. It's not that hard, doesn't really require that many tools. It's something you can do at home, save a whole bunch of money. So we're gonna go ahead and get right into the video. But before we do that, let's talk about some of the tools you're gonna need to do this job. Some of the tools you're gonna need to do this job, uh, the basic tools, you're gonna need a 17 millimeter socket for the wheel lug bolts, an E18 external Torx uh, bit for the caliper carrier bolts. That's the same as the front and the rear, a seven millimeter Allen for the caliper guide pins, a six millimeter Allen for the brake rotor set screw, and then uh, an eight millimeter socket, whether it's a three eighths or a quarter, I used a quarter, uh, specifically for gaining access to the connector housing for the rear right brake pad wear sensor. It's behind the splash shield, so you have to move it out of the way. And also, there's some pop rivets there too, so you're gonna need, pliers like this also help with that. Along with that, some screwdrivers and pry bars. These are really useful for uh, removing the anti-rattle clips, particularly on the front where there's a bunch of spring tension. Ball peen hammer, really useful for vibrating the rotors loose because they'll sometimes seize onto the hub due to corrosion. So these are really useful. A light, also useful. If you're working in a darker environment, you'll be able to see a little bit better. You'll also want a combination of ratchets. I just used a 3 8 and a quarter. And I have a half inch torque wrench for the 110 newton meter torque spec for the caliper carrier bolts. And then a 3 8 uh, torque wrench for the 30 newton meter torque spec for the caliper uh, guide pin bolts. Other than that, some optional tools here. I have a brake bleeder set up for Motive to bleed out the brakes at the end of the surface because I'm gonna choose to do that today. Also, this really nifty uh, bleeder wrench from CTA. This is an 11 millimeter. The bleed screw on the front and the rear are 11 millimeters, so only need that. These little hooks to hold onto the caliper are also super useful. Uh, also, I'm gonna be using this file to remove some of the corrosion and gunk that's built up on the caliper carrier where the pad sits, so it's kind of another useful thing to have. And then I also have this uh, caliper retractor tool, uh, just in case I'm not able to push the pistons back in by hand, but the way that I traditionally do it, I can honestly do it with my, uh, with my hands. It shouldn't be that hard. If the pistons are in good shape and the calipers aren't seized, I uh, should be able to push them back in with the method that I'm gonna show you. And uh, so with that said, let's go ahead and get into it. All right, step one with any brake job, you need to raise the vehicle up and get it properly supported, whether it's on jack stands, or on a lift, but uh, make sure it's stable before you ever start working on it and make sure it's stable if you put your body under the car and it's properly supported. Can't stress that enough. After that, you can go ahead and take your wheels off. You'll notice this nice, fine grossness on this car. It is winter up here in New England and uh, trying to keep a car clean this time of year is, is basically impossible. So don't even really try. I uh, did torque all these wheels. I recently had them off and you'll notice because they just come right off. What will typically happen, uh, you get a lot of corrosion on the hub. It's really good to sometimes go in there, clean it all off, which we're going to do during this brake service anyway. Um, but uh, if your wheels are not coming off easily, it's because you have a lot of corrosion between the aluminum wheel and the steel hub, and galvanic corrosion is kind of a problem. So clean off whenever you have the chance. So on this vehicle, I know the front rotors are machined at some point and the front pads were replaced. Uh, it's the rear brakes that need to be replaced. Uh, but like I said, I just want to do all four corners. These are all original parts. So just want to go ahead and get rid of them and start fresh. But uh, what we have here is a set screw that holds the rotor to the hub. It's a six millimeter. It is an Allen. Uh, the key here is make sure that the bit is all the way in. If it's not, you run the risk of stripping it. The set screw, uh, all it does is it holds onto the rotor during assembly of the car. It doesn't actually serve any purpose outside of that. If you were to strip, the Allen out, you have the option of either drilling it or you could take a chisel and uh, hit the corner of it, make a little groove, and then start rotating it, uh, hitting with a hammer. Next up, we need to go ahead and remove the uh, anti-rattle clip. Uh, the anti-rattle clip basically holds the outside of the caliper here uh, to the caliper carrier. Uh, the caliper has a rubber bushing for the guide pin, so without this, uh, under braking, what would happen is this caliper would move around a little bit the pad would be a little bit loose, you'd hear a knocking noise. 
Uh, so we need to remove that first. It is spring loaded. Sometimes you can actually just uh, pull them off with your fingers, but I don't think I'll be able to do this one. Um, basically what you want to do is you want to depress the center. You don't want to pry from here. I'll see a lot of people try to do this. You want to press the center. Okay. Like that. And there's little ears on the inside that once you have this depressed, you should be able just to pull it right off. You can see the little ears right here. They sit inside these little holes on the caliper. And like I said, it's a, it's a spring, so you just have to depress the center. And I just use the second pry bar to sort of get a grip of it. Uh, this design, these are a little more challenging. The older, slimmer style ones are a little bit easier to get off. But like I said, depress the center. And if you need to use a, uh, another screwdriver to sort of get behind it, just wanna make sure that these ears are out from behind this little groove here. Next up, we're gonna move the caliper guide pins. Your car should have these dust caps on them. If the dust caps are missing, I recommend ordering replacements because what the dust caps do is they prevent uh, moisture and dirt from getting inside of here. And that could cause uh, binding or corrosion on the guide pin, which uh, would cause the caliper to potentially seize because it wouldn't be able to slide back and forth. This is a seven millimeter Allen. Just gonna break them free. And these should not be that tight. I'm gonna go ahead and pull them out. You're gonna see some, some, some dirtiness on the guide pin. We're gonna go ahead and clean that up before reinstalling. And we're also gonna inspect the guide pins at one point. But now at this point, we can actually go ahead and pull the caliper off. My recommendation when doing brakes, it's helpful to have a hook like this to hold onto the caliper while you do the rest of the work. To help remove the caliper, you can actually pull on a little bit from behind. That'll depress the piston a little bit. And then you can just go ahead and slide it right off. And I'm just gonna go ahead and hang this up out of the way on the upper control arm. Actually, I'm gonna hang it on the spring. You know what, I'm gonna hang it wherever it wants to hang because not are a lot of good places here. So we have these two big E-Torx uh, fasteners here that hold the caliper carrier to the knuckle. Uh, these are E18. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and use an impact to uh, speed up the process. But uh, yeah, using a breaker bar or even a big ratchet, you should be able to take these off no problem. So the rotor's most likely gonna be stuck to the hub. Again, it's because of corrosion uh, where the uh, rotor sits on the hub. You'll sometimes get some corrosion that builds up there. And since it's a precision fit to begin with, all that does is just sort of squeeze the rotor onto the hub. So go ahead and take a good old hammer. I'm gonna go ahead and tap the rotor. I'm gonna start here on the hat. Should help, vibration should help uh, shimmy this off. And if you want to be safe, you could throw a lug bolt back in and, uh, you know, so the rotors will come flying off at you. But uh, I was feeling pretty confident there, so I went and lived a little bit dangerously. So before I retract the uh, piston, I just wanted to pull this clip off of the brake hose, just so I can move the caliper a little bit more freely. It secures the brake hose right here. Uh, just a flathead screwdriver be able to pull it right off. Um, what I've gotten in the habit of doing is I, I used to just push the piston back in, which honestly, most people are going to end up doing that. Uh, but what I do now is I crack the bleeder, push the piston back in. Uh, that's going to push out brake fluid that's inside the caliper, which is going to be probably in the worst condition since that's what's heat cycled. Um, I just want to force brake fluid back up through the ABS. And also, I'm going to go ahead and flush the whole system out afterwards anyway, but I just don't like pushing brake fluid back through anymore. So uh, this is the way that I do it now. Your caliper should have a dust cap on the bleeder screw. If it doesn't, make sure you replace this because uh, you're going to get stuff that builds up inside and then you won't be able to actually bleed out your brake system. You have to replace the whole screw. Uh, this is an 11 millimeter uh, bleeder screw. I'm using the special CTA bleeder wrench. Been playing with these for a while. They are useful. You'll see why in a minute. 
course, you know, you never really know how tight somebody made a bleeder before you got there. And now the bleeder is cracked. I'm just gonna go ahead and manually push the piston back in by hand. Now you can do this with a tool, but realistically speaking, if you can't push the piston in by hand, you have a problem with the caliper. And that's a whole other issue you're gonna have to address. Once I've done that, we'll tighten the bleeder again. Wasn't really that much fluid in there since the pads in the front were newer, but like I said, it's not fluid that I just pushed back up in. If this was super worn down, you'd have a lot more fluid that comes out. I would imagine it's gonna happen in the rear, but that's just the way I go about doing it. Next up, we're just gonna go ahead and pull the pad off. It's got these retaining clips on it. Should come off easily. Also to note, doing brakes is pretty disgusting. So wearing gloves is, uh, is definitely a uh, nice thing to have. So on the wheel hub here, you can see uh, a lot of this corrosion. That red stuff is just grease. I went ahead and put that on there uh, a little while ago uh, just to prevent corrosion between the wheel. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and take this little, uh, this metal brush on this drill. And you can also see right here, this little ring of rust on the outside of the hub. The rotor actually sits on that. So this corrosion buildup is what prevents the rotor from easily coming off. So I'm gonna clean all that off. I'm gonna clean the face off. I'm gonna clean the seating area for the wheel and the rotor. Basically get it back to bare metal and uh, we'll go from there. Also might wanna wear eye protection. Here's the old rotor. Obviously you can see the wheel hub sits there since that metal hasn't corroded yet. Uh, but this outer edge that I talked about corroding, that outer edge sits right here. And so you have corrosion on the rotor and you also have corrosion on the hub. And since this is a very tight tolerance fit, uh, that additional corrosion makes it so that it's very difficult to remove. So when you have it off, now's the time to clean it all. Uh, so when you install the new rotor, number one, it fits properly, uh, but also the hope is on these coated rotors, um, hopefully some of that corrosion won't be as much of a problem. We we'll go ahead and install our new rotor. Now, like I said, it is coated, uh, but you don't need to clean or remove the coating. Leave it as is. And uh, what'll happen is when you go to bed in your brakes, uh, the brake rotor or the brake pads will remove the coating from the friction surface of the rotor. Um, the reason why the industry has gone towards coated rotors is if you look at a lot of older rotors that come in plastic bags with an oily substance on them, that was to reduce corrosion in shipping or while it was packaged. These rotors are completely coated, so obviously uh, any surface that doesn't come in contact with the brake pads won't corrode as quickly. Uh, but the nice thing is you don't have to worry about cleaning them. They're good to go out of the box. Uh, when these things are manufactured, they're coated at the factory. They're pretty much clean from day one. So less time on installation, I guess, is the uh, best way to put it. Before we get carried away, we want to make sure that we clean all of this nastiness off of the brake caliper carrier. Uh, the pads sit here. You can actually see uh, where the pads were riding. Uh, so the pad sits in here and the pads do need to be able to move. And the problem is if you just reinstall these uh, with all of this corrosion in here, you do risk the pads binding up and not being able to move freely. Uh, BMW does not use uh, metal shims or stainless shims on most of their brake setups. So it is pad to caliper carrier contact. I'm gonna use this uh, special uh, caliper carrier file. It is specifically intended to remove this corrosion uh, without basically uh, deforming or removing material from the caliper carrier itself. Uh, so, well, don't have to be gentle with it. You just kind of go in there and just gonna go ahead and scrape this stuff out. Yeah, you can see this is all corrosion or uh, old brake pad material that's coming off. You could also do the same with <clears throat> like a bastard file or something like that. However, you do want to be a little bit careful with that because you could start removing material from the carrier itself and you don't really want to do that. Uh, this file is safe and will not remove too much material. Uh, but part of doing a brake job on any car is a lot of cleanup and uh, making sure that any component that you're reusing, which you know, it's gonna be a caliper carrier or the caliper or brake hoses, that everything is functioning the way that it's supposed to, that everything is in good condition. Um, be an absolute waste of time to go in there and do a brake job to find that your new pads have you know basically bound up on the caliper carrier because you didn't do any cleaning beforehand 
an ideal world, if you had a sandblasting cabinet, this would be cake. Also, if you don't have a file like this, you could also use sandpaper or a wire brush. A lot of different ways to do this. Uh, but like I said, the key is you wanna try to clean this area as much as possible so when you install the new pads, they're sitting on metal. It's pretty clean with just the file, but I'm just gonna hit it with the wire wheel one more time. This is just on a drill, nothing crazy. Now that the caliper is clean, we're gonna go ahead and reinstall it on the knuckle. Probably didn't mention this, but uh, it does help to rotate the front axle, especially when you're doing front brakes, because you can get a little bit better access to all of the individual components that may otherwise be possible if you were just doing it uh, with the wheel straight ahead. I am just going to tighten these by hand here, and I'm gonna go ahead and torque them to spec. Torque spec on these two carrier bolts is 110 newton meters which uh, roughly 82 foot pounds. Just taking a look at the rubber bushings on the caliper. Uh, they're still round, they're not ovaled out. There's no tears or any kind of damage on the inside, so these are good to reuse. It's always worth inspecting these because this is what the guide pin sits on. And technically this is what mounts your caliper. So if these are messed up, the caliper may not be able to move correctly and uh, generally be a bad time. So always uh, be on the lookout for that. Just gonna reinstall the spring clip. Like I said, it's not necessary to remove it. I just removed it to, uh, to move the caliper out of the way a little bit more. What I'm gonna do next is take our outboard pad. Just kind of slide it in. It moves around nice and freely. No binding, that's what you want. And I can also do the same uh, for the inboard. Obviously that's not the correct orientation. That's not where it gets installed. But my point is the pad can pivot and move freely. That's what you want. Next up is gonna take the same uh, wire wheel on the drill and just uh, clean the guide pin. This'll just come right off. All we're doing is basically burnishing it. So next up, we're gonna take some of this, uh, looks like ceramic paste. It, it's the lubrication that's included with the uh, brake pads. And just gonna put it on the ear of the pads like so. Uh, when it comes to lubrication and brakes, less is more. Um, I used to lubricate the guide pins on these cars. I do not do that anymore. Um, those should be installed dry. It's more important that they're installed clean. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm just lubricating the ears of the pad uh, because this is what rides on the caliper carrier. And you want to make sure that, uh, number one, they move freely. So it's just a nice thin coating. Don't have to go crazy with it. And if you really wanted to, you could also um, apply a thin layer to the caliper piston face. Um, yeah, I've done that. I don't see really any benefit there. Uh, if anything, it would probably be for noise abatement, but... Again, it's just more of a, a matter here of lubricating these ears. That's really all that I do. Uh, now, if you had a brake setup where the pins were inside the caliper carrier, you do want to inspect those and make sure that they're lubricated. That would be with silicone paste. Uh, but that's usually rear brakes, and that's not very often common on BMWs. Most of the setup has the external guide pin. So yeah, like I said, just a thin layer. It's all you need. And uh, just slap the pad on the carrier like that. We'll put the inboard pad on the caliper once I change the gloves over, because I want to make sure I don't get any of that lubrication on the pads or the friction surface. We'll take our inboard pad. And uh, you have these ears that you kind of need to depress. But uh, we'll just click right in. And the caliper slides right back into position, like so. Uh, if you find that the caliper will not fit back on, it's probably because the piston isn't pushed all the way in. Just go ahead and push it back in and you'll be fine. So next up, we're gonna go ahead and reinstall our guide pins that we've cleaned. The tricky part is just getting them lined up. 
uh, but you can visually see where the threads poke through between the caliper carrier and the guide pin boot. So just a matter of getting those first threads started. Torque spec on these guide pin bolts is 30 newton meters. Once they're bottomed out, you know, with a hand ratchet, they're gonna be tight enough. You don't really need to go crazy on that one. I would say the torque spec to be concerned with is your main caliper carrier bolts. So lastly, we need to install our anti-rattle clip. Uh, anti-rattle clip currently not installed and I'll show you what I mean about flex. That's how much the caliper will move on those guide pin bushings without this rattle clip in place. And that is gonna make a lot of noise under braking. So it is important that you install these. So the, the key with these anti-rattle clips is to make sure that these spring ears are actually on the caliper carrier like such. And then you just have to push inward with your fingers so you're depressing from here until they catch the caliper. There we go. Hopefully you saw that, but uh, again, um, this was a little tricky just because the ears of the spring were so close to the edge. Uh, the way that you get, like I said, the way that you get that in is you have to squeeze from the center here and you can see how those little arms sort of spread out. And then as you're pushing this, you know, towards the back here, you just wanna make sure that those hooks uh, that we talked about earlier catch onto the caliper. Now that it's installed, caliper doesn't move around at all. That's what an anti-rattle clip does. And uh, all you need to do right now is just pop the caps for the guide pins back on. Like I said, you may want to make sure those go back on because it prevents stuff from getting inside that boot. So that's about how you go about replacing the front brakes on an F15 X5. It's going to be very similar on any BMW with this style uh, caliper. Uh, the only thing that we didn't touch base on was the pad wear sensor because we're working on the right side of the car for the video. Uh, on the front uh, pad wear sensor for the front axle, it's actually on the front left corner. Uh, BMW typically doesn't do pad wear sensors uh, on each corner. They do it for the front left for the front axle and they do it on the rear right for the rear axle. Uh, so we'll go ahead and cut to a clip showing you how you go about changing the pad wear sensor on the uh, front. So on the front left corner, like I said, with the pad wear sensor, here it is. It's always going to be located on the inboard pad. Uh, but basically, as you can see, it just routes along the caliper, up over the knuckle, back down under the knuckle, up here to this little electrical box. Well, which shares with the uh, ABS connector or the ABS sensor connector. Uh, to remove it, pretty straightforward. Just pops out. And then you just follow it. And you come right up here to this electrical box. Like I, like I said, this is shared with the wheel speed sensor. The key is, if you're underneath the car, don't look up into this box because it's usually filled with gravel and all sorts of other fun stuff that'll get in your eyes. There we go. That's a uh, basic pad wear sensor layout on the front. Uh, key is just follow uh, where the pad wear sensor goes and then you know it always ends up in a junction box up here like that. Um, now the cool thing about these wheel speed sensors, you might see that on the rear, uh, these are actually considered a two-stage sensor. So uh, there's a trip on this uh, when you hit a minimum pad thickness that's considered safe, uh, the rotor will actually touch the tip of the pad wear sensor, set off the first stage. So essentially it reduces the resistance of the sensor. That's how the car's onboard system knows that it's time for a pad change. And then there's the second stage uh, that it hits where, yeah, at that point you've hit your absolute maximum threshold. I think we're going to see that on the rear pad sensor since it did get tripped. All right, now we're moving on to the rear brakes. It's honestly very similar to the front, with the exception of we can't really rotate the hub around to accommodate us. And we also have to deal with the parking brake potentially, uh, but we'll talk about that when we get there. So start off, we're gonna remove the anti-rattle clip. This one actually might have a little bit less tension on it than the front did, because it's smaller. It's right there, there it is. <clears throat> Same thing, push from the middle, depress it, it should come right off. Remove the dust caps for the guide pins. It's going to be seven mil. Okay. 
so our brake pad wear sensor is on this back right corner, like I've said, when we're doing the front. So what I'm gonna try to do to make retracting this piston easy is I'm gonna try to push the entire thing back in by hand with the bleed bottle. So the rear uh, caliper was super easy to push in by hand. If the caliper is hard, like once you have the uh, bleeder open, if it's really difficult to retract, you have a problem with the caliper. So as you can see, the pads in the rear are very thin. That's not really much meat left. And also the inboard pad is, is basically the same. It's even wear. And like I said, these are two stage pad wear sensors. And the first stage gives you your first warning. And then your second stage gives you your, hey, really got to do your brakes. So those two copper contacts you could see, uh, that is uh, the first stage of the pad wear sensor being broken through. And what happens is it reduces the resistance in the circuit. And that's how, you know, basically your onboard diagnostics know that your uh, pad is thin. So we need to uh, disconnect the pad wear sensor from the basically connector housing, which is tucked up in here behind everything. You have two eight millimeter screws here and then uh, two uh, self expanding rivets that you need to remove uh, on the fender liner, on the lower portion of the fender liner. And then what you'll be able to do is basically just peel this back and then the uh, connection, uh, connection housing is right there. So now it's just a matter of tracing that all the way back over. And there's a little bit better view of the first stage that was tripped. Caliper carrier bolts are E18s and pretty much once you break them free, you can unthread them by hand. There isn't really that much room back here, unlike the front, just because the knuckle doesn't pivot. Well, shouldn't pivot. If it pivots, you got a problem. This is a six millimeter, just like the front. Actually, it's pretty much all the same tools, which is pretty nice. I'll go ahead and tap it with a hammer. That came off super easy. I was a little worried it was gonna get hung up on the uh, parking brake mechanism. Uh, but honestly, it, I haven't used it since I've owned it. And I doubt the previous person did and I can't really tell you how many times emergency brakes are even used on automatic cars anyway. So when you're doing rear brakes on a car that has this type of parking brake mechanism, you have to line up the wheel hub so that you can see the star wheel, which is right here. And then you can come in with a flathead screwdriver, you know, through the rotor hole, through the lug hole, and then you can actually adjust the star wheel. So right there, I'm shorting it and going the other way uh, expands. So this is an adjuster that helps expand. Um, if the uh, rotor won't come off, you might need to adjust this, depending on how often you use uh, that parking brake mechanism. Now that everything is apart, we're just gonna go ahead and clean our caliper carrier, get the heavy deposits off with this caliper carrier file. Torque spec on these carrier bolts is 110. So we're gonna go ahead and install our pad wear sensor onto the pad. Just clicks into place, simple as that. And then from there, we take the connector or wire lead from it. It's gonna come right up through the top of the caliper like so. And then it gets clipped into place like that. Yes, the brake caliper is currently hanging from the hose, which generally is a no. However, this rear caliper is very light and I put it there, I placed it there. Unfortunately, you know, I like to hang things, I like to hook it, but just isn't any room to work on it and do it. Like I said, rear caliper is super light. It's not causing any damage. Just hanging here like this, it didn't drop into this position. Next up, we're gonna take the caliper, place it into position. We're gonna install our guide pins. Uh, one way to know that the guide pin actually goes in is if you're pressing on the back side of it with a socket, the tip of the guide pin where the threads are should just fall into the hole on the caliper carrier. I don't know if you just heard that click, 
But yeah, that's the guide pin sort of finding its home. Torque spec on these guide pin bolts is 30 newton meters. So went ahead and reinstalled the padware sensor. Um, you know, it runs up alongside the control arm here into this, um, you know, wiring lead housing, and then it runs up along the back side. Comes with the box back here. It just, you know, it takes time, and you want to make sure that it's routed properly since the suspension does travel vertically. You don't want that to be too tight or too loose. Uh, so, you know, a little tip: if you haven't done it before and you're not sure of how to put it back in. Take a picture of what everything looked like before you took it out, and uh, that'll be a reference for when you uh, put it back in. However, um, the connections on the wiring lead pretty much only go one location, so once you know where those main points are, uh, the rest of it just kind of falls into place. We're gonna reinstall these expanding rivets uh, that hold the fender liner in place. Like I said, we had to remove these before just to uh, gain access to that electrical box. Okay, that won't go in for some reason. There we go. We have uh, two self-tapping screws, uh, they're eight mil. These self-tapping screws are exposed to the elements, so if you find that uh, the body nut, they don't really thread too nicely together, you could put a little bit of drop of an oil on it, and uh, that'll help threading it back in. And uh, last, we're just gonna go ahead and install the anti-rattle clip. There we go. Uh, like I said, just push from the center and make sure those ears on the spring or the anti-rattle clip actually hook onto the caliper. And then we just need to reinstall our dust caps onto the guide pin boots. Have left the uh, bleeder cap off, but that's because we're doing a full brake flush to go with the brake service, which we're doing next. So what I normally do when I, when I do a, any type of brake service, so that's uh, brake pads or brake rotors, usually do them both. Uh, it's not a bad idea to also flush out the brake fluid. Um, Generally speaking, every two years is sufficient, but generally I do it every year. Uh, I really like this motive power bleeder. I've had this for a pretty long time. Uh, it's a one-man bleeder. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pressurize it to about 15 pounds. And I'm gonna go to the uh, back right caliper, crack the bleeder screw, let a bunch of fluid come through. And then I'll do the rear left, the front right, and then the front left. Uh, BMW does have information about, you know, turning on the ABS pump uh, to do this. However, I don't really see the need to do that uh, because as long as there was no air introduced into the ABS system or the brake system during any type of service you've done, uh, particularly before the ABS pump, there's really no need to activate the ABS pump. So, you know, if you replaced a master cylinder, you would have to do it. Or any lines that go to the ABS pump, you'd have to do it. Uh, but Anything downstream shouldn't have to activate the ABS pump for any reason. So uh, I see that often get mentioned. I mean, it won't hurt to do it, but it's just one extra step and I don't really see the point uh, in doing it. Plus you need the scan tool to do it as well. So uh, right now I'm just looking at the fluid coming out and I'm looking at the level of the bottle. Obviously the fluid that's coming out is really clean. That's a good thing. Uh, you don't want the fluid to be coming out looking brown or black. Um, you know, like I said, I, I normally just flush brake fluid once a year in all my cars, it's easy to do, uh, particularly with a power bleeder. Now you've probably seen some bubbles coming out of, through the hose. Um, I don't think that's coming out of the brake system itself. I think that's just a connection at the hose. The only thing that I found with uh, bleeder screws on these Ante calipers is once you crack them, they're kind of loose. And uh, it, is a, it is a conical seat where the uh, bleeder screw goes in the caliper. And so you'll get some wobble um, on the bleeder screw. So to counteract that, I'll just push the bleeder screw 
uh, back into the housing a little bit. Also, sometimes you can see bubbles uh, in the catch bottle or coming through the line, especially if the bottle is below the bleeder. Uh, sometimes if you raise it up, you'll get a little bit more of a solid stream like this. And I always started the uh, back right uh, just because that is the longest brake hydraulic line uh, from the uh, ABS pump or hydraulic unit to the caliper itself. So I always start on the longest line and then work to the shortest line. That's just kind of a habit that I have. And I always bleed out way more than I ever need to, but I like to make sure it's thorough. I don't want this car in 10 years to have brake fluid that comes out looking like this. As you can see, the uh, stream coming out, no bubbles. So good on this corner. The other thing that I'll do is I'll come back after I bleed all of the calipers out and um, I'll take some brake parts cleaner and some shop rags and I'll clean the bleeder off, make sure that there's no residual brake fluid uh, either in the bleeder or on the caliper itself. So I'm gonna leave the catch bottle above and I'm just gonna watch. Like I said, sometimes if you have the catch bottle below, uh, you'll see bubbles in the line. Uh, but if you leave it above, you'll you get a little bit of a better idea whether you actually have air in the system or not. It's just one extra step in the process, but you know, I said I like to do it at the same time. And just in case you're wondering, I'm using uh, Ate Type 200 brake fluid, which is a uh, it's dot four. It's not really a dot four racing fluid. It's more like a dot four plus. So it has a little bit of a higher boiling point than a normal dot four and it has a little bit of a higher wet boiling point um, than a normal DOT4 would. So it's more like a performance oriented um, DOT4 brake fluid, but uh, BMWs generally don't use any kind of, like they don't use like a DOT5.1 or a DOT4 LV. Pretty much any DOT4 you'll find today anyways, low viscosity by default, but. So outside of the uh, emails and text messages I've received from the dealer I purchased the car from saying, hey, it's time for rear brakes. I also have this wonderful notification that tells me rear brake pads, as if the squealing wasn't enough. And also, if you ever wanted to see any information under vehicle status, uh, a section called Service Required, it's going to tell you um, basically how long you have left on certain items. So it says rear brake pads doing 1,000 miles. That start as 1,200 miles when the uh, first stage of the pad wear sensor was uh, triggered. And uh, I'm also gonna do a brake flush today as well. It says it's due in uh, October, 2021, but whenever I do brake rotors and pads, I also flush the brake fluid at the same time. So uh, yeah, this is one way I know that I needed, the, uh, needed to do the rear brakes, but uh, I'm gonna do all four corners today. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, reset the service intervals for the front brakes, the rear brakes, and uh, the brake fluid. We have a quick video that shows you, know, shows you the details on how to do this. So as you can see, it's pretty straightforward to replace the brakes on an F15 X5. There really isn't that much required in the use of tools. Uh, everything is pretty straightforward. It's a pretty basic uh, braking system. Uh, shares a lot of similarity to a lot of other BMWs on the road. Uh, so if you got that quote for you know, $1,000, $1,500, $2,000, whatever it might have been to do a full brake service on the car, you can do that for a fraction of the price. The only things that I recommend you do at the end of the brake service is obviously reset your warnings. Make sure you pump the brake pedal several times so you have a firm pedal before you start driving the car because you will be scared to death once you realize you have no pedal. You wanna make sure that those pistons come back out and that the pad is actually touching the rotor. So make sure you pump that brake pedal at the end of the brake service. Um, and other than that, as you can see, very straightforward, pretty simple, it can be done in a couple of hours and you'll save yourself a bunch of money. So hope you learned something today. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment box below. Hit that like button if you like this video. Also hit subscribe, we have plenty more content on the way. And as always, we'll see you for the next one. Later.